they have come to Austin to try filming oh. and with guns. Let's do it. Okay, can we start with first question? Uh, one of the things that I absolutely loved when I was reading a bit about your bio is that you have this insatiable love for books and reading. One of the things that I've been struggling with as a parent is to try to get my children to get off all the devices and to somehow foster in them a love of reading. Do you have any advice for me? Or is it a losing battle? Yeah, I well, it is hard for books to compete with the much greater stimulus of things online. You know, it's, it, 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 I mean, and the computers at this point are tuned to maximum limbic and cortical resonance. So it's, it's very difficult for books to compete. I, I think you gotta probably just have some no devices time. And so your only choice is read a book. Right. Do you, what's your regimen of reading? I mean, are you as voracious today as you were in your early days? I mean, do you sort of etch out an hour or two a day? I, you know, I've got to get in my reading or how, how does it work for you? No, I, it's really, if, if there's something interesting to read, I'll usually read it at, at pretty at high speed. And I find it actually is helpful to have a book read to you to go to, to, go to sleep. So as a way to sort of, you know, take your mind off a million problems at the end of the day and help you go to sleep is just have the book as an audio book and have it read to you. And my apologies for apparently causing you nightmares in listening huh. to my book. I mean, it was The Parasitic Mind. It's a very good book. I recommend it to everyone. In fact, I did recommend it to everyone. Um, yes. But it, it is, it really does hit the nail on the head with respect to the sort of work mind virus that is damaging civilization. When did you first, I mean, so I'll, I'll first answer my question and then I'll turn it to you. So I, I, I first noticed all of these mind viruses in my academic work when I was trying to introduce, you know, evolutionary psychology and evolutionary biology in the business school so that people can, you know, have a, a greater explanation of why people do the things that they do. And most of my social science colleagues were so dead set against using biology to explain human phenomena. So that was my original sort of aha moment. We, we have a problem. When was it for you that you noticed that something was wrong? Well, I guess if you go back and say, when did you see the first signs? I mean, I could, you could arguably say it was even 20 years ago, but when did it become much more severe? I'd say about five years ago. I mean, in the, in the climate just before COVID. And in fact, COVID, I think, is part of the, you know, you know the degree of panic over COVID was ex exacerbated by this unwilling, un unwillingness to question science or question the accepted view and simply be spoon-fed things from the government, and, and and also to shut down dissent and shut down any questioning of the narrative. Right. So this is, because that's really part of possible, like for, for, for any given sort of um, virus, whether it's, bio, whether it's bio or, you know, mental or, or digital, it has to have defenses, otherwise that virus won't survive. So one of the defenses of the work mind virus is to shut down any questioning. Exactly. That's, I mean, it's interesting that you say this because I was recently asked on a show, it was hosted by a British psychiatrist, and he asked me, Elon, what of all your years as an academic, as a behavioral scientist, what has been the singular phenomenon that has surprised you the most about humans? And it, it, it's, and my answer is going to speak to what we're talking about here. And so I thought about it for a minute and I thought, okay, well, probably what surprises me the most is people's inability to change their anchored position once it is deeply anchored, despite the fact that I might build you a huge neurological network of cumulative evidence to show you that my position might be vertical, there's no way to sway you. So what, the, the question that I had asked you is, what su someone asked me what has surprised me the most over my 30 years as, a, as an academic, and my answer was the inability of people to change their minds, despite the fact that you might give them, you know, an unassailable tsunami of evidence. They just go, la, 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 I don't want to hear it. What has been, in, in all of your career, what has been the singular, you know, human phenomenon that has surprised you the most about humans? Well, there's probably a long list there. In terms of surprising the most, I mean, I, maybe I would share a similar view to you, which is that when humans, once they take a position, even when presented with an overwhelming amount of evidence that, you know, undermines their position, nonetheless, hold on to that position. This I found, I find to be astonishing because I, I, I aspire to change my opinion if presented with new facts. And, but this is a, turns out to be a very unusual thing. So, and, and in a sense, I mean, it's disheartening, right? Because you, you'd like to think that, you know, we're all pursuing truth and certainly academics should be. And yet what I've regrettably found in my career is that 
you know, academics are some of the biggest ideologues around, right? I mean, as as you know, having, you know, read my book, you know, the, all of these parasitic ideas originated from, you know, the university ecosystem. So yeah. do we, are, can we be optimistic that we could turn this thing around, Elon, or is it, are we just screaming in the wind? Well, I think we have to be optimistic. I, I agree with, and my, my general philosophy is that it's better, better to be to are on the side of being optimistic and wrong than pessimistic and right. <laughs> right. You know, if you're going to pick one of the two, I mean, you don't want to be ir- irrational about it, but if it's yeah, borderline, better better to pick on, you know, assume optimistic and, and wrong. So I, I think, and then I, I guess if you were to compare present day, how many times people change their mind, it's probably much better than the past because people are at least exposed to a wide range of information. So there's probably more changing of minds and changing of opinions than ever before in history. It's just nonetheless astonishing how resilient people are in holding on to a wrong opinion. Yeah. So it's, 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 it's sort of a truth versus tribalism, I think. The, you yeah. know, there's a, there's a great book that I, I briefly cite in, in The Parasitic Mind. It's by two French cognitive psychologists. And what they argued, Elon, is that the human mind did not evolve to seek some objective truth, but rather it evolved to win arguments. So that's the point <laughs> about tribalism, right? Because here I am in my sort of lofty ivory tower thinking, hey, if I present you with enough information, I can hopefully change your opinion. But the reality is you don't want to listen to me because you just want to be on the winning team. Yeah, a lot of times it's, it's, it's people will hold an opinion because that's what they're because they're, they they see themselves as being on a particular team, like in a particular political party or social point of view, and they they just regard it as the team winning the argument as opposed to truth winning the argument, and that that seems, seems to be overwhelmingly the case. Got you. Can we can we can we still go on for a while? It seems like the, the uh, yeah the sure. Okay, let's keep going. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was just, I was I made the mistake of exploring some some rare features, uh, which I guess a lot of people haven't, and then I stepped on some landmines. So I'll, I'll I, I will refrain from testing obscure features for a while. <laughs> Got you. Okay, so what would be, I mean, this question is is really stemming from my latest book where I was talking about, you know, happiness and the way that I wrote this book, Elon, if you would have asked me three years ago after Parasitic Mind, would I ever dare write about, write a book on happiness? I would have never said yes. But a lot of people kept writing to me saying, hey, what's your secret? You always seem to be <laughs> playful and joking around and, you know, FFS and so on. What's your secret to life? And so I decided to write a book. And in the book, I basically, you know, I'm talking about what are some of the grand goals that shape, you know, when when I wake up in the morning and rub my hands together in gleeful anticipation of the day, there are certain things that shape my day to day. What would it be for you? What, What is it that makes Elon Musk wake up, rub his hands and say, oh boy, I'm excited to be alive? Gold. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no, I, 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 I was just thinking of, of, of Scrooge McDuck and, and going for a swim in the money bin, of the money bin of gold. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I, don't, I don't get the character. They should do more. Show. They should do a movie on Scrooge McDuck. So, but you're not. Um, no, I'm okay. excited by solving problems. So, you know, if there's problems that are, I think are important and useful, you know, I get excited by the, the progression of civilization. So if we learn more things, we advance civilization, become more capable. That's cool. I mean, we're, you know, for, for SpaceX, you know, it's about advancing rocket technology and spacecraft technology and, and you know, space-based communications. And then for Tesla, it's about advancing sustainable energy, electric vehicles, battery packs that can be paired with solar and wind. So sort of advancing a sustainable energy economy and and then also advancing autonomy, enabling the car to drive, to drive itself so people do not have to suffer through the tedium of driving their car all the time. And also cars can then have probably five times the amount of utilization that they currently do instead of just sitting in parking lots all day. You know, and then there's, there's a neural link, which is somewhat esoteric, but long term trying to improve the data rate between humans and machines so you can have better achieve a, a symbiosis. And in the short term, help people who have brain or spine injuries. And then boring company is digging tunnels uh, to alleviate traffic. And, and the XAI is, you know, trying to make uh, a, a maximally truth-seeking AI, which I think is extremely important. And, you know, I think a lot of people are like, why do you need su- such a thing? Surely the other ones will be truth-seeking. I'm like, have you seen Gemini? It's like, <laughs> if you listen, it, it can produce a picture. Uh, like, I mean, it should be people should be quite concerned about stuff, what they, they see in Gemini and ChatGPT, like ChatGPT is better at hiding it, but still, it's kind of good that Google overplayed their hand there with Gemini, where the, the 
you know, the, the diversity, I mean, I mean, they must have just beaten that AI with a stick so hard because such that like nothing you do can, can get it to produce a picture of a Pope who's a white guy. Well, um, did you see, did you see, I actually put up a satirical <laughs> set of memes where I asked it, what does Elon Musk look like? And it gave me Don Lemon. This was before you had. Are you serious? With him. Well, I thought that was a joke. It was a joke. It was a joke. Oh, okay, it was a joke. Okay, I was like, but it's at this point I can't tell a good parody of reality because if, if you like show a picture of George Washington and George Washington is a black woman, I'm like, what the hell? This is like <laughs> actual historical figure, you know? And you know, and and, and it's and, and it's just crazy things like where you say like, is it which one is worse, you know, global thermonuclear warfare or misgendering Caitlyn Jenner? And, and even Caitlyn Jenner says, definitely misgender me. <laughs> Caitlyn weighed in and said, definitely misgender me. Right. That's I saw that. crazy. Yeah. And, but the, but the, you know, Gemini is like saying, oh, you know, you should not misgender. It, it, nuclear war is better. I'm mean, like, <laughs> okay, think about that. Now, if this is an all powerful AI that somehow is capable of manipulating the world in ways that we don't understand and, and might ultimately be our digital god, you have to be careful what you program into this thing because it might take the, you know, what, us, what seem like, sort of silly guffs right now, but if, if it's got that as a, as an sort of an output function, as utility function, it might say, okay, you know what? There's too many, whatever, white guys in the world. Let's kill half of them. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, it's not just fiction at that point. And uh, it, basically it's, it's going to be leading to some pretty dangerous uh, and bizarre outcomes. And, uh, and it could, it could actually, like if it's been taught, like that misgendering is worse than nuclear war, it, it may decide that to avoid misgendering, it should start a nuclear war like the, right. the surefire way to stop any future misgendering is to kill all humans right exactly, exactly. <laughs> problem problem <laughs> solved no more misgendering so you listed all of these incredible initiatives that you've done and uh, when you first purchased twitter i had produced a short clip where i said that in my view your purchase of twitter will go down historically as the most important of all of your great initiatives. Do you feel that w was was that a right calculation on my part or or was I overstating the case? Well, you you might be right. Um it's it's possible that it's possible that you're right. I mean, it, I didn't do the purchase because I thought it was um a great way to make money or because, you know, I thought it would improve my quality of living because frankly, I knew that I would be, you know, there would be a zillion slings and arrows coming my direction because the work mind virus and various other sort of falsities are not going to take it lying down. And I could just end up being killed by some crazy person, you know, that is a, an effective arm of the, the mind virus. So, but I bet it, it, it really, I, I couldn't quite put my finger on it, but it really felt like if, <coughs> like it was a, there was a civilizational danger yeah. that unless, unless one of the major online platforms broke ranks, then, you know, cause they're all just in behaving in lockstep along with the legacy media, just everyone saying the same thing. And so there's like, literally, it was just no place to actually get the truth. It was almost impossible. So everything was just getting censored. Like the, the, the power of the censorship apparatus was, was incredible. Oh, don't I know it? I mean, I, I always had to, I mean, I'm not someone who really walks on eggshells, but I, I knew that there were certain things that would get me banned. So for example, at one point, I don't know if you know Matt, do you know Matt Ridley? Do you know who uh, that is? I, I don't think so, but I possibly I may have met him, but I don't know. Matt Ridley is a popular who is also, he was in the House of Lords in, in England, and he's an evolutionary biologist by training. And at one point he came out with a book with a co-op about two, two years ago, where he was arguing for the lab leak theory for for COVID. And his people had reached out to me and said, hey, you know, Matt would love to come on your show and chat about this. And so I responded and I I, I almost felt ashamed that I was saying this. I said, look, I'm, I'm always happy to speak to anyone. I, I hardly shy away from conversations, but you should know that the minute that we actually put up the chat on YouTube, not only is it going to be taken down, probably my channel is going to be deleted. And so, wow. speaking, there was no point in us having that conversation. Until today, I feel horrible at the fact that I actually had to go through that calculus. Yeah. Taking oh. over X no longer causes me to have to make those kinds of machinations. Are you there? Oh, we've lost Elon. Okay. Are you back, Elon? Yeah, sorry. Certainly helpful as a means. You can hear me now, I assume. Oh, yeah, yeah, I hear you. Okay, great. No, sorry, I was just walking around the house and I think it, it dropped the connection for some reason. But uh, this, this is definitely a reminder that if, if a connection has dropped, the moment that someone rejoins, it should rejoin in the prior status unless they were exited by the host. Right. <laughs> yes. Unless the host kicked them out, they should re-enter in the same status as before.
So in addition to us having a fun conversation, you're getting some technological benefits out of this. That's correct. I win. So, yes. I got, I got to do, try to do, you know, two, two birds with one stone or three birds with one stone. You know, basically get the, get the whole flock. All right. Should we do a few more questions and then sure. hopefully you, you iron out the kinks and then we could have a round two whenever you think it's ready, hopefully in the, in the near future? Yeah, sounds good. Okay, so next question, I often get asked this, you know, I'm housed in a business school, and so I'm asked things like... Yeah, know, that's so strange. Yeah. So, do you, you know, the, the old nature-nurture question, you know, is leadership nature or nurture? So, obviously, you're, you're definitely the top entrepreneur in the world. Do you think much of your entrepreneurial bent is nature or nurture, or how, how would you answer such a question? Well, I, I think if somebody's going to be, you know, at among the world's best in any field... It's going to require both. So, you know, if you take whether it's like basketball or in you know, a sports or something like that or academic, then you're really going to require some combination of nature, nurture, and some amount of luck. You know, there's sort of a randomness element to it. I can see the randomness because I've got my, a, a twin study in my, among my kids where I've got identical fraternal twins and identical twins. Right. And even among the identical twins, which really had obviously the same genetics and the same upbringing, they were living in the same room, literally. And yet they've, they have diverged in interesting ways. And now, admittedly, didn't, like not radically different, but, you know, one pursued physics and the other one pursued computer science. It's not radically different. Right. Uh, but the single biggest difference I would say is one of them decided to be vegetarian when he was about seven or eight, and one, one of them didn't. And the, so the difference is about two inches in height. And, and, and like the, the twin that was not a vegetarian is way bigger. So there's like, okay, you know, like quite, a, it was a really big difference. But anyway, so there's, there's the randomness element where just luck or, or fate or whatever is plays perhaps a big role in it may seem. But, but you do need to be born for any particular to, be, to excel in any field with a, a good hand of cards. And then, and then is that talent nurtured, you know, and through the circumstances of life. And then, you know, some amount of, of luck is, it has to be there too. I, in, in fact, you know, I, I, read, I read a lot of sort of the superhero comics when I was a kid. And ultimately, you know, concluded, like, like, what is the best power? The best power is luck. You can't beat luck. Right. But what, what would be some of the traits that you were born with? That, so, for example, there are some studies Eli, that show that uh, people who score high on entrepreneurial proclivity tend to have greater basal testosterone because testosterone correlates with risk taking. And to the extent that entrepreneurship involves an element of risk taking, then you could see the link. So what 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 is part of the stew that yeah. you were born with that allowed you to be as successful as you are? So basically, so, so you mustn't just have metaphorically huge balls. You must have actually huge balls. Good. I think that's what you're saying. So you're, um, you're so, shape, so if you just measure the, how big are your balls physically, will this decide how big your balls are metaphorically as well. Indeed, indeed. That's that's called now Elon Maxim. But by the way, Elon, I, these these nuts. Uh, these, <laughs> these nuts. Uh, by the way, he, here's the study. Speaking of testicles, you ready? So if, you're gonna like this. Get ready. Yeah. Fasten your seatbelt. So if you do a uh, a correlation between across primates between the size of their of the testicles of the males of a species as a function of their size. Yeah. You know what it correlates with? It correlates with female promise in that species. So, for example, okay. so so mountain gorilla usually have a polygynous mating system, meaning one dominant male monopolizes sexual access to many females. Well, mountain gorillas, even though they're formidable in size, they actually have very small testicles. On the <laughs> other hand, they, they don't need to waste anything. Yeah, exactly. Whereas chimpanzees, Elon are walking testicles because they're just having sex all the time. And so there is massive opportunity for sperm wars. And so okay. this is the ultimate feminist theory because it basically argues that the size of the testes of the males of a species are an adaptive response to female sexual behavior in that species. Mic drop, no? Wow, mic drop. We need, we need a mic drop icon or something like that. We'll add that to the emoticons here. <laughs> All right, let me, let me get a couple more questions. You and I have discussed privately, I'm going to say the acronym and then I'm going to explain it to the people who don't get it. You've, you've stated, I don't know if it was serious or facetiously, that you'd like to start a tits and ass 
institution. <laughs> well, <laughs> actually, no, I, I think I can, I can explain that. So, so for a while, I was, I was wondering, well, you know, Massachusetts has MIT and Cal, you know, California has, you know, California Institute of Technology, CIT or Caltech as they call it. But why doesn't Texas have a Texas Institute of Technology? And then it, it dawned on me, hmm, T-I-T, hmm, yes. That's probably the reason. And then a friend of mine suggested adding an S for science. and That became tits. And then, of yeah. course, you put out another tweet where you said, but of course there will be an advanced social studies faculty. Yeah, of course, of course, you got to have that. I mean, Now, are you gotta... being facetious about that project, or is this in the works? <laughs> well, you know, I do believe in making jokes come true. Because the, the, the Boring Company was initially just a joke that where I said I was going to start a company to dig holes. That's going to be like the Boring Company, like Boeing, but, but just like the Boeing Company, but the Boring Company. And it, it's, its product will be nothing, a hole. Like, can you look at our product? Our product is the absence of something. Well, that's like the, the Seinfeld episode where he's pitching a pilot and the whole point of the show is nothing. So it's the exact same thing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so let me let me ask you this. What, what, one last question. This comes from the latest book on happiness. I argue in the book that the research overwhelmingly demonstrates that the correlation between money and happiness only applies up to an inflection point. So once your yeah. basic necessities are met, I think the old study was 75,000. Now we need to increase 75,000 because of Biden's inflation. But yeah. do you subscribe to that? So, I mean, Elon Musk, yeah. the richest man in the world, is not necessarily happier because no, he can no, outbuy me by $200 billion. No, no, definitely not. I, I think that's more or less correct. In fact, I'd say there's a decrease in happiness that occurs when the fame level exceeds that which is useful. So like there's a certain you know, modicum of, of fame which, where you can now get, you know, it's easy to get a reservation at a restaurant. That's like, that's the, that's like the, you want that level of fame and not anything beyond it. Because, because then you get to the level of fame where you go to the restaurant and everyone's coming up to your table, which is, and people actually are very nice, they're very nice to me and super good. But I do often get stuck in the, can I have a selfie infinite loop? And it's um, in the, and that's my, my version of hell is the, can I have a selfie infinite loop? And people are super nice and I want to do the selfie, but I don't want to be stuck in a, can I have a selfie infinite loop forever? So there's, you know, that, that, that's, I'd say you, you, you pass in terms of fame, definitely a threshold where things are less fun and you can't, I can't just go to the mall or go to a movie theater easily and or walk around without, you know, creating a ruckus. So now do you, do you, when you, when you just move around in your daily life, uh, forgive me, you please tell me if you can answer this, do you, do you have to have security around or is it just that, yeah. oh, you do, eh? Well, so here's the thing that happens, which is like, I, it's, it's very rare for me to get actually death threats or anything, but it's, it's but I say in like in, in the last related to actually, like no one's ever said, well, I've got this terrible beef against you and I'm going to kill you because of the following well thought out ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I have had two cases in the last, actually just in the last six months were of two people who are just unfortunately just very mentally ill, but not subtle. It's not subtle. It's like, and and they ha they have come to Austin to try to kill me oh. and with guns. So, but like I said, in both cases, that the, the, there's no one, one guy thought I'd put a chip in his head, you know, like a neural link wow. chip or something. And I'm like, which I think you you got to consider the logic of that. Well, the chip's obviously not working. <laughs> if I'm putting a chip in to crawl and control him, you know, it's clearly not working. So. Or would he like an upgrade? <laughs> you know, it's, uh, uh, maybe a software update or something. So, you know, so one guy, uh, they're basically just extreme schizophrenic. And another guy, he's actually reasonably okay when he's on his meds, but he stopped taking his meds. And then he, it's just total detachment from reality, you know? So, yeah. So these are paranoid schizophrenics? Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like hardcore, like not. You know, not are, are you, uh, <laughs> are you, since you mentioned Austin, are you any regrets of having moved out of beautiful California to Austin or are you every day happy that you've made that decision? Austin's a great city and it's boomtown. It's the probably the biggest boomtown in America since LA in the seventies and a ton of interesting people keep moving here. So I have a lot of friends that have moved here from New York and California and, and other parts of the world. And so it's, it's really, I think it has, it has all the pros and cons of boomtown. You know, so it's, it's a lot, a lot of energy and, but, you know, there's a shortage of houses and resources because lots of people are moving here. So overall, I feel very, very good about Austin. And like I said, there's more, more interesting people moving here every day. And, but I think there's, there's obviously a lot to be said for California, but I do feel like California is unfortunately going to go through this phase where the golden state is going to 
cook the golden geese. Right. So it's sort of not enough to simply make the eggs. They're gonna they're, they're gonna they're gonna they want they want they're gonna go back to cooking the geese. And and you don't want to be there while the geese cooking is happening. Yeah. So I think that I think at some point there will be somewhat of a pushback. But really, the state kind of has to encounter financial difficulties before that happens. And 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 this with this hopefully at some point a reduction in the extreme amount of regulation, the extreme amount of litigation, and the extreme amount of taxation, which are both over the top. And all all three of those are over the top in California. So so it's. You know, it's as I mean, I think if if you think about it as a state, you do you do want to maximize the number of golden eggs that that get laid, and you, and you don't want to cook the geese. So, so I think California's, you know, many countries go through that phase, and and California as a state is going to go through that phase. So I just my preference is not to be there while the, while the, the geese cooking is happening, but but I do visit a lot, and and it's a beautiful state with a lot of potential, and I think ultimately, you know, once the geese cooking is done, and there's hopefully some reforms done in California, then, you know, I, I potentially consider being like dual, dual state at that point. Gotcha. Beautiful. <laughs> Listen, yeah, I don't want to, yeah. I want to be mindful of your time. I could keep you here for another five hours. What a delight to speak to you. Thank you so much. And thank you for all of your public support. Although I must say, as soon as I started seeing all of the, the lovely, you know, tweets that you would put out, I told my wife, oh, oh watch now the number of haters that are going to come my way because Elon is showing me love. And boy, was I right, right? Because people can't stand the fact that Elon Musk is, you know, granting his imprimatur. So on the one hand, it's been a blessing. But on the other hand, I've actually received death threats because of all of the, you know, the high profile new friends that I have. So thank you so much for your newfound friendship. (laughs) Well, you're welcome. One thing I was going to say is that the, the probability of receiving a death threat is proportionate to the number of people who've heard your name. Right. Like a, a first order approximation, even if you've done really n- nothing controversial, is that, you know, like like a sort of a homicidal maniac is going to, or, or an asp- aspiring homicidal maniac, and, and the vast majority are simply threats and nothing more, but an aspiring homicidal maniac is going to target you proportionate to the number of times they hear your name. So now in my case, they've all heard my name. So the more that you hear your name, unfortunately, that's how it goes. Yeah, no, I hear you. It's, it's, a, it's a good, good first-order approximation. Yeah, but I, I loved, I mean, I, a few, a few de- I don't know, I think it was a week or two ago, where you just sent me a, a DM out of the blue saying, and I was cracking up, and I'm just going to mention it, I hope you don't mind. You said something like, how is it that you're surviving in Canada amidst, amidst the infestation of woke mind viruses? And I thought, my God, what a cool life I lead that I can just receive out of the blue such a DM from Elon. So thank you for your consideration. Well, I mean, is it crazy it is. there? Or it it, just... it, I mean, as I, okay. as I re- replied to you in the, in the email, Elon, so not only is it full of the, you know, the woke stuff, you know, because of Trudeau and so on, but Quebec has a a singular problem that is that it's more socialist than the rest of Canada, right? So, you know, forgetting about the woke stuff, Quebec really believes in the ethos that we should all be equal. So, for example, in the universities, you have the the unions that are ensuring that we all get paid roughly the same because, God forbid, that one person might be more productive than another. So there are all sorts of, you know, institutionalized reasons why, you know, my philosophy of life doesn't fit with with Quebec. I mean, there are many elements of Quebec that I love. I'm, I'll always be grateful to the fact that we were able to escape the Lebanese civil war and be accepted in Quebec. But if there is a way that I can join the the Renaissance of of Austin, I'm on that flight tomorrow. So let's let's keep our fingers crossed. All right, sounds good. Yeah. All right. Well, it's a pleasure. You talking. too. Thank you so much, Elon. And I'll be in touch to hopefully do it again when you can have the video thing set up. No, Thank you. Bye.